Hey there, Bob here with JD Squared, and I'm very excited about making this video. It has been a long time coming, but thank you for tuning in. Anyway, what we're going to be talking about in the next uh, eight or nine, ten videos is a lot of uh, structural steel, angle iron, C channel, things like that. We're going to talk about step files, NC1 files, how does it work in our software, what are the different ways that we can cut material on our rotary machines, such as uh, this C channel that I've got here. In fact, there's three different ways just to cut it along. So uh, we're going to make individual videos of how to do that. So we'll be describing a video, for instance, right here. We've got the ring system set up. How would we process this C channel if we want to spin it in the with the ring here? Um, generally, spoiler alert, you generally don't want to do that. Now the other way is do we want to lay it flat or do we want to use our new stabilizer systems that we just came up with the very, very large stabilizers for the XR12 and XR6. So let's go ahead and first talk about the three different ways that the XR12 or XR6 can handle um, different work pieces. Very first thing we need to talk about is file formats real quick because I know a lot of you guys have been waiting and are super interesting to hear about NC1 files. So let's talk about file formats. The first file format, of course, is a DXF file format. That's what is described flat patterns that, for instance, you would be cutting out on a plasma or a laser cutter. Don't forget, our XR rotary machines are perfectly capable of cutting flat, uh, flat metal. So for instance, the XR12 right here could cut up to 24 inches wide, 24 foot long flat metal. So in that case, our program, Camelot, would be looking for a file format called a DXF, drawing exchange format, that's your flat stuff. Now, in the 3D world, there are multiple ways to convey that information, multiple file formats, uh, step file, IGUS, uh, NC1 files, things like that. Let's talk about the step file first because it is the most um, common by far. Now, a step file will give you a 3D part, the entire part 3D. Bins, like if you've got railing and you've got bins in it, all the bins and everything are in the step file. So our software can easily, um, not reverse engineer it, but it can back it out and say, okay, you got a bin right here. How much is that tubing going to stretch and everything like that? So if you're working with railing, um, square, round tubing, I suggest, without a doubt, go with a step file. It's very easy to work with. However, step files have one large disadvantage. Um, on steering industry, for instance, they want to mark out all of the places where they're going to have to weld brackets onto the stringer, for instance, to mount the steps and everything, right? Step file has no way to convey any marking information such as engraving or something like that. Giant disadvantage, but hey, what are you gonna do? Anyway, back in the 90s, a file format was created called the NC1 format. And this was a supposed to be a format that could be utilized by multiple machines, read by that post processor, and whatever that machine specialized in, it would do that operation. So for instance, if you had a machine that, um, let's just take this one here, and you wanted to cut out your stringers or your shapes, we can read that NC1 file and cut it out. Now, a major advantage of the NC1 file format is it does have the engraving information into it. So we can easily engrave now where all those brackets need to be welded. We can handle that pretty darn easily. However, what an NC1 file format doesn't do, at least I have not been able to find it, and I've been studying it for several months now, is the bins on railing, stuff like that. I found out that it, yeah, it does round tubing, you can miter it, stuff like that, but I have not seen any indication at all that it'll handle bins. So that's why I recommend if you're doing railing, uh, stay with a step file. But if you're gonna do a stringer or something and you want the engraving, you have gotta go with an NC1. Fortunately for you, um, our Camelot now handles all of those file formats, and we can handle them in multiple ways, depending on how you want to process that part. So, without further ado, let's talk about the three different ways to um, 
process parts on the, on, in this case, we'll be talking about the XR12, but it does work for the RC6, the XR6, et cetera. Same, pretty much same process. All righty, let's do that. The most obvious way to cut something on a rotary machine would be to rotate it, right? And that's what you see right here. We're able to rotate this part. So we can start cutting and we could basically roll right around as the machine is cutting and then we can cut that part out. In order to do that, you have to fit what's called rings onto your workpiece because since it isn't round, you gotta spin it, so you gotta put rings on it. You also use what's called a jig plate, and I don't know if you can see the little shiny plate back there. In a previous video, I did a whole video on a jig plate, showed you how to set it up, what they were the whole bit. The idea of a jig plate is a universal way of mounting just about anything you could think of, a hexagon flag pole, C-channel, I-beam square, round tubing, stuff like that, can be accommodated in a jig plate. However, you do have to set the jig plate up before you could utilize it for something such as this C-channel. Now, that whole process takes like a whopping minute and a half. It's not a big deal, but it is another step, right? So, the biggest disadvantage of using the ring assembly and of spinning this is those marks that we talked about earlier that the people in the steering industry want to put down the stringer. Wherever you put your ring, and you're only going to run one ring, you cannot run multiple rings with channel because, or, or just about any structural steel, because the stuff is never straight. And if it isn't straight, the rings will not stay in alignment with each other, which means they're going to fight each other when they're spinning. Only one ring should be utilized per job. But where that ring is, you cannot put any markings. Yes, I can come out here and I can cut the end of my C-channel and I can start marking somewhere around here, but I'll have a dead zone in this area because we have to clear the ring itself with the torch, the marker, stuff like that. So you end up with a dead zone, which means you're back to the same old game to where, at least in this area, I would have to manually figure out where to weld my brackets, where to put the marks on, stuff like that. So it turns out that even though the process you would think would be the way to go, it's actually not the way to go. Um, the other ways of doing it are the much preferred method, by the way, and, and I'm conferring with my existing customers who are, are in this industry because all they care about is how fast can I get this part out of my building? I, that's where it is. So what they're looking for is a reduction in labor. They don't care if they've got to do a couple operations. How, where, where is the biggest reduction in labor? And it turns out it's all these marks. Now, I, you see me keep pointing at this C-channel here, and that's because there's actually an engraving mark in it. And real fast, this little piece right here was actually a much larger piece a while back and it was done for one of our customers who has our rotary cutter, their stair builders, and this was one of their stair parts. So I just cut it short because I couldn't get the long piece into the machine. So I will take a picture so you could see the engraving that I'm talking about. Anyway, there's the method we talked about that you gotta rotate it. Now remember, you gotta load up this channel every time you gotta load it up. Now it's not very hard. It takes you about two to three minutes. It's generally gonna require two people for something as large as 12 inch C-channel because it's relatively bulk, bulky. A lot of our customers don't want to do that. They want one man. They want this simple and easy. So what we developed was the flat way of doing it right here. So what they're going to do is they're going to take their C-channel and they're going to place it on these flat adapters that we provide with the machine. And they're just going to, they just want to push it to the rear, clamp it down, and then what they want to do is just process the face. So they want to cut the ends. They want both ends of the stringer exactly cut perfect. And then they want all of the engravings marked all the way down it. Now, what they do, this is what they're telling me, is after they do that, what you're going to see, once again, look at the picture, is we did not cut all the way through the flange because clearly we're not rotating the part, right? Well, it turns out that, according to them, it takes less than 30 seconds for them to take a cutoff wheel and just go in and cut that flange off. So what they did is they traded time. How much time are we going to lose by not rotating the part, cutting the, cutting the flanges, and giving up the engraving 
you know, how much time are we going to lose by having to come back and manually engrave it? Well, it turns out that you lose more time doing that and you got the potential of making an error, whereas cutting off the flange with a cutoff wheel, evidently, according to them, super fast. Now, you could also, of course, just zip it down with a plasma and cut it off. I'll be dead honest with you. That's the way I'm going to go. If I was building stairs, I'm not going to spin it. I'm going to do this here. Here's why. I can load up multiple of these plates all the way down my machine. I buy this material in a 40-foot length. I want to be able to just either use my boom crane, a couple forklifts or whatever. I want to be able to just come up to the machine, drop the workpiece onto my flats, push it against the back, go back there, tell the machine where home is and hit the button and let it start to do the hard work. Let's cut the ends so that we know the ends are exactly true. We don't want to cut them by hand. Let the machine do it. They'll be precise. Let's put all the markings in it. Now we can handle 24 feet, even though we got a 40 foot piece in it, we got 16 feet hanging out this end, not a big deal. Because what I'm going to do, as soon as I'm done doing that marking, I'm literally just going to cut off the two flanges on this end and then slide that other piece into position and start processing it. While I do that, I take out the other one that I've already taken out and I just go ahead and knock the flanges off while the machine is cutting and engraving on the face. So, without a doubt, this is the best way, in my opinion, to handle the stringer, the long part, with a lot of engraving. Not necessarily the steps, but the stringer itself. Now, um, this also plays a lot, um, or it helps you a lot when you're dealing with metal that may not be pristine. We have one of our customers who's got our machine, and he just got a batch of 12 inch C-channel because that's what he does. He's staring industry railing and all. And it mic'd out at 12 and an eighth inches, so it's oversized. So when you're doing a rotational job, you're referencing off the middle. When you're doing stairs, generally you're referencing off of one edge. So that extra eighth of an inch may screw things up a little, may not. So anyway, that's the second method to do it is that way. Now, the other thing I like about this is doing it this way, I could easily process, say, a 12-foot stringer, put all my marks in it, and then come right along. And if I've got any other weird shapes, steps or something that are maybe a little bit different, let's just say you're doing a spiral staircase and you've got steps that got angle cuts on each end, well, I can precisely do all that. I can also drill better if I'm flat. When you're rotating and you drill, we have to use what's called these supports down here. Now in these videos that I'm getting ready to make, I'm gonna be going through each one of these processes individually, showing you the, you know, how, how we did it that particular way from cam to finished. This is why I'm shooting this video because the information I'm conveying to you right now is common across all these videos and you don't wanna hear it eight times and I don't wanna say it eight times. So anyway, there we go. Now, when you drill, you have to have a support when she's square, because if you try to drill out here, for instance, you're pushing, you're fighting the machine with the force of the drill, which could be about 200 pounds. When we're dealing with flat, no such issues at all. We don't care. We can drill anywhere we want on this thing, never miss a beat. Now, we are also currently doing routines because let's say, for instance, it's very important that you have holes that are precisely located from one edge of the material. They, that's it. Well, this particular channel right here has got about an eighth of an inch bend this way, you know, flat way going long ways. So if I was just to start drilling holes straight down this part here, in the middle of the part, somewhere around here, the hole is gonna be about an eighth of an inch further from the edge than I really wanted it to be. Now that doesn't happen doing it this way too much because it turns out that we could bolt the clamp out here and literally take the, the bow out of it, you know, with, the, with our clamp, which I don't have on the machine right here, but you get the idea. So that is one of the reasons why I kind of like doing it flat and I believe that's the preferred way. Now, the third way to do it is this is our brand new stabilizer system that we just brought out for the XR6s and XR12s. And by the way, this bad boy's heavy. She's clocking in at just under 90 pounds. Now, in, in the next few videos, you'll see us using this, and this is a stabilizer. So this is gonna mount on 
the, let me just set this down before I do something really stupid. This particular thing here is going to mount onto our gantry, which means it's going up and down with the machine. Works out pretty good for short parts. You wouldn't want to use a stabilizer, um, for instance, if you were doing a stringer, because the stringer would have to hang out of the stabilizer, like this particular stringer is going to be 12 feet long. You can't do that. I mean, the leverage is just way, way too much on the machine. And I mean, this thing's built like a tank. I mean, I've literally got four bearings in every roller. I've designed this thing to just to withstand the apocalypse, but it cannot withstand that. Physics is physics, you know? So the bottom line is stabilizers are very, very good for doing short pieces. So if, for instance, I wanted to load up a 24-foot piece of my channel and I wanted to start cutting out a bunch of short, small parts, say a, a foot, foot and a half long or whatever, the stabilizer is the way to go now. And yes, in this case, we are going to be rotating the part. So we're going to be cutting the, um, the flanges, everything, markings, everything. We can do that with this. We just cannot do the stringer because of physics, you know? Now, I'll be talking about the new rotary deal. I know there's a customer who just called. He's very excited. He's doing a job, I think, 12 by 6 inch square rectangular tubing. This is your answer right here. Now, this system right here is very fast, very easy to use. Um, but once again, it's targeted at short pieces. So that is your three different ways of of handling material in an XR12. The, X, the XR12 and the XR6's job is simple. To be the, one of the most versatile products you've got in your building. If you've got something where I need to cut flat metal, let the XR12 do it. If you want to um, do channel and you want to drill holes, you want to engrave or whatever, the XR12 can do it. If you're doing railing, we're going to bring in step files, the XR12 is going to do it. It will not compete with a 800 or million dollar beamline machine when it comes to doing C-channel. Those machines are very specific. They're, 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 they're pretty cool. I don't think they're worth a million dollars, but that gun, they are cool. Um, so anyway, what we're looking at is, or what we're shooting for is a solution for your average medium to smaller shop that says, listen, I can't justify uh, Python X, which are great machines. I've seen, uh, I met Max Vortman, who does the Vortman machines, incredible machines, beautiful. But boy, you've got to have a lot of work to justify a million dollars. We're trying to um, fill that void to where, yeah, we've got the job, we're working along, but you know, we're not gonna spend that kind of money. And this way here, we've actually got people buying multiple of these machines because while one is doing the one job, the other's doing the other, whereas their beamline machine, one job at a time, and they don't like the beamline for doing round tubing or anything like that. They said it just doesn't handle it very well. So since they've got to buy a machine like this anyway, let's try to make this machine as versatile as possible so that maybe you don't have to buy a beamline machine if, if you don't need one. Anyway, I believe that will do it for this video. I'm just, just trying to convey to you the three different ways to process it, talk about file formats. The very next videos I'm going to be shooting, we will be doing an NC1 import into Camelot, coming out here, handling a stringer, and then we've got other ways to do it. Now, we're going to be doing that stringer in multiple ways, rotating it, laying it flat. The first one we're going to do is flat because, as I mentioned, that is the way you really want to go. You may not realize it yet, but that is the way you're going to want to go. Um, but if you want to do it the hard way, knock yourself out, you know. My, my mind is if I could do the job in 10 minutes instead of 20, I'll take the 10 minute route. Anyway, I think I'm done. I really appreciate you. Look forward to seeing you. Well, I won't see you, but I look forward to you seeing my next videos because um, like as I mentioned earlier, this has been a long time coming. We're extremely excited about working with NC1 Files. Appreciate you. Hope you have a great day. Take care.